Hey y'all, good evening to everyone and anyone listening to this read-through of the Deviant African Genders that Colonialism Condemned, an article on JSTOR by Mohammed El Naim. I apologize in advance for any mispronunciations that I butcher. English is my first language, so if anything sounds weird, it's probably because of that. Um, the article opens up with a terracotta memorial p- portrait of an Akan ruler from present-day southern Ghana. It's kind of like a f- um, like a face bust, but cast iron and metal. And here's the article. In pre-colonial times, wrote the late feminist scholar Naira Sudar Kasa. Women in West Africa were conspicuous in high places. They led armies, often played important consultative roles in politics, and in the case of the Lovedu people, present-day South Africa, they were even supreme reign queens. What is meant to be a woman in many African pre-colonial societies was not rigid. Among the Longi of northern Uganda, writes Sylvia Tamal, dean of, fac- dean of the Faculty of Law at Makere University, Uganda, the Maduko, Dako, or effeminate males were treated as women and could marry men. There were also the Chibados or Kambanda of Angola, male diviners who some scholars have argued were believed to carry female spirits through anal sex. For centuries, woman-to-woman marriages in pre-colonial African societies seem to indicate to Europeans that the strong correspondence between male-to-man and female-to-woman was not prevalent in Africa. This, this practice of same-sex marriage was documented in more than 40 pre-colonial African societies. A woman could marry one or more women if she could secure the bride wealth necessary or was expected to uphold and augment kinship ties. The idea that a female could be a husband perplexed Europeans and often led to fantastical conclusions. Writing in 1938, the anthropologist Melvin Jean Herzkovitz imputed assumptions on women-to-women marriages that were, in in the words of the anthropologist Eileen Jensen Kriggy, foreign to the institution. He insisted that it is not to be doubted that occasionally homosexual women who have inherited wealth utilize this relationship to the woman they marry to satisfy themselves. Although he was operating on pure conjecture, no documented women-to-woman marriages were known to be lesbian marriages. And while heterosexuality was certainly the dominant form of sexuality in pre-colonial Africa, Tamal notes that there is no doubt that same-sex copulation was also practiced. An anxiety that historians discern in historical record is how uncomfortable European travelers and later anthropological accounts were with the idea that their gendered worldview didn't easily map onto the societies they encountered. There is, among the Angolan pagan, much sodomy, wrote one Portuguese soldier in 1681, sharing one with the other their dirtiness and filth, dressing as women, and they call themselves by the name of the land, Gambadas. In another story, the the Inquisition in Brazil had heard complaints of Francisco Manicongo, one of the Negro sodomites who serve as passive women, a Jinbada from Central Africa, who had to be punished for being a deviant in the eyes of Christians. Europeans adverse to what they call sodomy expressed distress towards the idea that some people whom they perceived as men would dare be considered by their societies as women, with what the slave trade and colonialism implied that more often forced but sometimes voluntary movement of people across the Atlantic these transgressive gender performances became the target of the Inquisition. The church disseminated that the message that individuals who did not conform to their ideas of men and women could be a bad influence on Christian colonial society. One of those target was Vittoria. Her story was popularized by the groundbreaking work of Brazilian queer historian Luiz Mott. We know of Vittoria, originally a slave named Antonio from Benin, West Africa, from the authoritative accounts of the Portuguese Inquisition in Lisbon, which had her arrested in 1556. She, she dressed as a woman and worked in the riverbank of Lisbon, where she would beckon men like a woman enticing them to sin. 
Under the questioning by the Inquisi Inquisitors, according to James H. Sweet, a historian at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, Victoria insisted that she was a woman and had the anatomy to prove it. The Inquisition was not convinced and she was eventually given a life sentence. Whereas the Portuguese could only see deviance and sodomy, their feminine gestures, their same-sex behaviors, were simply expressions of their broader spiritual roles, roles that went completely unrecognized by the Portuguese. It would be anachronistic to call these ways of being transgender. That would be to retrofit them into, the, into gender categories that, were you, that we use in the 21st century. But the theological frustration with deviance and sodomy that was often used to repress them is familiar today. As Tamal puts it, the ironic truth is that it is not homosexuality that is alien to Africa, but the far off lands of Sodom and Gomorrah, plus the many other religious depictions of other sexuality that are often quoted in condemning same sex relations on the continent. The same can be said about campaigns that inter intermittently condemn trans men and women in Africa. In Tamal's view, these are state-orchestrated moral panics serving as decoys to distract from socioeconomic and political dysfunction. What the memory of Vittoria and the many other non-conforming victims of the Inquisition demonstrates is that it is not homosexuality and trans identities that are a colonial import into Africa, but homophobia and transphobia instead. Thank you all for listening, and y'all have a great night.